Hello, we welcome you to the program today. We're studying the book of Job, chapter 42. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to the passage, and let's begin. Job chapter 42, verses 1 to 6. We begin with verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said... Job's answer to the Lord closes out the dialogue we have in Job chapter 3 to Job 42, verse 6. After all that was said by Job and the three friends in Job 3 to 31, and Elihu or Elihu in Job 32, 37, the Lord answered Job, in Job 38 to 41. Now finally, in this last chapter of the book, Job answered the Lord. In Job 42, 1 to 6. So here in verse 1, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. Job acknowledges that God can do everything. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. He can do all things, that is, that are according to his will or his purpose. Job also acknowledges that no purpose of God's can be withheld from him. This is because he can do all things. From what the Lord said of his creation, there are so many things that man simply cannot do, let alone understand. And so God can do everything or all things that are according to his will or purpose. And so no purpose of God's can be withheld from him, or that is, no purpose of God can be thwarted. Verse 3. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I do, did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Job recalls the question asked by the Lord in Job 32, verse 38, verse 2. Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? God asked who darkens, chapter 38, 2, or hides, chapter 42, 3, the counsel of God by his words that are without knowledge. The term counsel may refer to the purpose of God. Job then answers the question. He acknowledges that he uttered words that he simply did not understand or know. As the Lord said, by words without knowledge. Chapter 38, verse 2. He also admits that he uttered things too wonderful, too amazing for him to know. He commented on subjects that were just beyond him. The knowledge of Job was limited, as the knowledge of other men. However, well, what God said was true of Job, that he said these things uh, he, he did not understand or know. It's also true, and more so, even, of the three friends and Elihu, or Elihu. Verse 4. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. Job humbly asks God to listen to him as he answers him. He again recalls what words were said by the Lord. Remember how the Lord challenged Job in Job 38, 3? The Lord said, now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Recall how that even after hearing from the Lord, Job first declined to speak any further. 
Job 40, verses 3 to 5. However, the Lord again challenges Job in Job 40, verse 7. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Now we see in this passage in Job 42 and 5 that Job is ready to answer the Lord. Verse 5. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Job answers the Lord. Job says how that prior to the Lord speaking to him, that his knowledge of God was like he was once one who had heard or just heard of God, but now he is educated. His knowledge is like one who sees. I was blind, but now I see. At the least, he now understood how little he really knew about God and his ways. God's ways so far beyond him. Job did not actually see the Lord. There, there's no vision recorded here. However, his experience in hearing the Lord was real. And so he has a comparison. Before, it was like I heard of you, but now it is as though I see you. I can see you for myself. And so he had this this knowledge now, this personal knowledge, even if that is knowing how little he really knew. Verse 6, Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Earlier Job said to the Lord, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Job 40, verse 4. Now, seeing, Job says, Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. While before Job refrained from speaking, now Job repents. Job is said to repent in dust and ashes. This was a sign of humble repentance. For example, Jonah 3, verse 6. Jonah the prophet preached, and the Ninevites heard and repented. He was not sorry of the accusations made by the friends against him, as they were not true. He repented of the rash things that he said out of anguish and desperation, as he admitted back in Job 6, verse 3, and 6 and 26. Here in the passage, the word myself is in italics. That indicates in this translation, the New King James Version, that it was added by the translators for clarity. The passage may be read without it. Therefore, I abhor and repent in dust and ashes. And so no object is given. It may be that Job is saying that he abhorred himself, or it may be that he abhorred the words that he had said. And so he abhorred, he loathed his words. The words that he said that were spoke rashly, without knowledge. In verses 7 to 17, we have the epilogue. Closes out the book. In verses 7 to 8, the Lord spoke now, spoke now to Eliphaz. Verse 7. And so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends. For you have spoken of me what is right, have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. The Lord now speaks to Eliphaz the Temanite. In the dialogue, Eliphaz was always the first to speak of the, of the three friends. 
The Lord says, my wrath is aroused against you and your two friends. The two friends included Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Naamathite. Job 2, 11. Again, Elihu or Eli Elihu is not mentioned. The reason stated for God's wrath being aroused against the friends was that they had not spoken of God what was right or true as his servant, God's servant Job, had spoken. The position of the friends was that God always sends suffering in this world to those who sin. And so when they saw Job suffering, they concluded, according to their false idea, that Job must have sinned. He is suffering, therefore he has sinned. However, Job pointed out how that this is not always true. Job 21 and 13. Sometimes the wicked suffer, that's true, but sometimes the wicked do not immediately suffer. And Job points this out to his friends. Note that it describes Job as the servant of the Lord. Verse 8. Now therefore take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams. Go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And for my servant Job, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept him, lest I deal with you according to your folly, because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. The Lord instructed Eliphaz and the friends to take for themselves seven bulls and seven rams, go to his servant Job, and offer up for themselves a burnt offering. He repeats here in this context. Job as his servant. He was not a he was not some wicked man. He was a servant of the Lord. What must the friends have thought at this moment? And so he tells him, tells them to bring their offering to Job. And his servant, Job, would pray for them. And so the Lord said that he would accept Job, his prayer, not to deal with them according to their folly. Again, the Lord says, because you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has. Given what they said to Job, they must have been humbled. During the dialogue, did they ever admit that they just might be wrong? Here he mentions burnt offerings. The burnt offering was probably offered to God for their sins. It doesn't specifically say that in the text, but it's probably the case. Remember how Job regularly offered burnt offerings for his children, just in case they may have sinned? Job 1 and verse 5. Well, now, Job is told to, to, to pray for these friends. Also note the description, the servant of the Lord. Remember what the Lord said to Satan in Job 1.8 and Job 2.3? Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And now he's, he speaks to Eliphaz and friends concerning his servant, Job. Satan used these men in order to tempt Job. But Job held on to his integrity. He persevered. No one like him. In verses 9 to 11... We see obedience to the Lord. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Naamathite 
went and did as the Lord commanded them, for the Lord had accepted Job. The three friends went and did as the Lord commanded them. The text says, for the Lord had accepted Job. That is, God had accepted Job, Job's prayers, not to deal with them according to their folly. God answered Job's prayer of intercession for the friends. Consider that Job, having recently repented himself, is now praying for the friends who said such, such things against him. Job is given as an example, not only of patience and his perseverance and endurance, but as an example of forgiveness. It's implied that Job forgave his friends as he prayed for his friends. Verse 10, and the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. The Lord restored Job's losses. He returned what was captured or what Job had lost. However, the Lord only restored the losses when he prayed for his friends. This again implies that Job's forgiveness of his friends. Not only did the Lord restore what was taken by Satan, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before, expressing how greatly the Lord blessed Job. Verse 12. The restoration of Job's losses appear to have occurred over time, not necessarily immediately. Job's prayer was a prerequisite of his restoration and blessing. Uh, it makes me think of the teaching of Jesus concerning forgiveness. Jesus taught his disciples about the forgiveness of trespasses. In Matthew 6, 14 to 15, Jesus taught the model prayer. And then he concluded afterwards, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. The text reads that he restored Job's losses. According to the footnote, this is literally turned the captivity of Job. That is what was captured by Job. And so he restored the fortunes of Job to him. Verse 11. Then all his brothers, all his sisters, and all those who had been his acquaintances before came to him and ate food with him in his house. And they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and each a ring of gold. Job's family, his brothers and his sisters and his acquaintances returned to him. They were no longer estranged from Job, and they began to spend time together with him. Again, this may not have happened immediately, but it happened perhaps over time. They consoled Job and comforted him for all of his adversity. The Lord had brought adversity upon Job only in the sense of of permitting Satan to afflict Job. This information was not revealed to the men. They gave Job gifts of silver and gold out of affection for him, his family and friends. In Job 19, 13 to 14, we see how that he describes his estrangement from family he has removed my brothers far from me, and my acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My relatives have failed, and my close friends have forgotten me. But now, in Job 42, verse 11, we see 
the reconciliation of a family and acquaintances. You see the, the family talking again and eating together again. It reminds me of how the sons and daughters of Job prior to their death would eat, eat and drink together. Now we see that family here is, is eating together once more. In verses 12 to 15, we see how the Lord blessed Job. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. In the beginning of the book of Job, we learn about the great possessions of Job. In Job 1, 2 to 3, it says, And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. The Lord indeed did bless the latter days of Job more than his beginning. The Lord not only restored Job's losses, what was taken from him, but gave Job twice as much as he had before. Verse 10. Verse 13. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And so the Lord also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. Once again, the Lord blessed Job with a large family, seven sons and three daughters, just as we saw in Job 1 and verse 2. Verse 14. And he called the name of the first Jemima, the name of the second Isaiah, and the name of the third Karen Hapa. Note the names of the children who died and are recorded. Those who had died, not one of their names is, is documented. Only of the latest children and only of the three daughters. The name of the first child according to the footnote, means handsome as the day. Jemima, literally handsome as the day. And some, some say dove. The name of the second, Keziah, is a name meaning kasha. It's a fragrance, according to the footnote. A variety of, of cinnamon. One author wrote, the name of the third was Karen Habak. The name is literally the horn of collar or the colorful ray. Uh, some suggest collar being applied to the eyes or the eyelids, the face. In verse 15, in all the land were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. The writer describes the beauty of the daughters of Job. He said that there were no women in all the land so beautiful or fair as Job's daughters. He gave his three daughters an inheritance among their seven brothers. This is noteworthy because under the law of Moses, daughters were given an inheritance only when there were no sons. Consider Numbers 27, verse 8. And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a man dies and has no son, then you shall cause his inheritance to pass to the daughter. Given that the inheritance is given 
not only to the brothers, but to the, the daughters too. This may be an indication of perhaps of his, his love, perhaps of his great blessings that he has so much that he gives to all. We're not specifically told the reason, but only that he did. This may be an indication that the setting is prior to the law of Moses, to the Mosaic law, given that the law given to Israel was that if a man dies, if he has no son, then cause the inheritance to go to the daughter. Passages like Numbers 26, 33 list that a particular man had no sons, but he did have daughters, and then it lists, the passage lists the names of the daughters. So here in this passage, we see the great beauty of Job's daughters and how that not only their brothers, but the daughters too had an inheritance from their father. Verses 16 to 17, the writer of the book closes out describing the age of Job and the peace that he found at the end of his life. Verse 16, after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. The text says that Job lived for 140 years after the time of his adversity. We are not told how long Job's adversity lasted, but it lasted at least for a period of months. Job 2.11, 7.3, 29.2. Some suggest years. We also know from this text that he was able to see, he lived to see his descendants, his posterity, for four generations. Verse 17, so Job died, oh, and four days. What was the age of Job? We are not told the age of Job. Well, while Elihu or Elihu said that he was young in age or young in years, he said that Job was very old. Job 32, 6. Now, we know age can be relative. We're not told how old or how young uh, this young man was, but he was young in comparison to Job, who he said was very old. Now, just how old, we're not told. Now, while we do not know the ages of Job's children prior to their death, they were grown by the time of their deaths. Job 1, verse 4. We see that he was very old prior to the additional 140 years that we see in verse 16. As noted in the introduction to the book of Job in our study, Job's lifespan is comparable with the ages given those in the patriarchal age or dispensation. The time, time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and others. Abraham, for instance, lived 175 years, according to Genesis 25, 7 to 8. Isaac, who was 180 years old, was said to be old and full of days. In Genesis 35, 28 to 29. Genesis 35, 28 to 29. So he uses those words, old and full of days. We see these words used of Job. So Job died old and full of, of days. From these facts, Job was well over 140 years old. Perhaps, perhaps over 200. Again, we're not told. As you study the lifespan of, of people beginning at the, at the creation, 
and down through time, these ages become less and less. But we see that even at this time, long lives uh, comparable to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But we see here Job in his old age. Job died old and full of eight, uh, days. So we see this peaceful end for, for, for the man, much like the patriarchs who were gathered to their people. What can we conclude in this chapter? And two in the book of Job. Job at one time, we consider the past, experienced great hardship. And because of his suffering, he longed for death. However, despite his adversity, he maintained his integrity. He endured, and the Lord, in his compassion and mercy, chose to bless Job. Of course, that was his, work, his will, his purpose in the life of Job. In the New Testament, the, the uh, disciple James writes concerning the example of Job. In James 5.11, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. We see that. We see what James saw in the book of Job. The lesson of Job is one of perseverance. The lesson is to be patient. Trusting in God, no matter the affliction that you face. Remember, in your affliction, do not blame God. Also, remember that the wicked are not always punished right away. And the righteous are not always immediately blessed. Be patient. Endure. Persevere, no matter what. And while the wicked are not immediately always punished or the righteous immediately always blessed, there will be the final judgment. And there is hope for the righteous. We don't have all the answers. Job certainly didn't have all the answers for why he suffered. And he said some things that were rash and without knowledge. We can learn from the book of Job. And we hope that you've learned a lesson of perseverance from this, this great book. Thank you for being here today and continue your study of the word of God.